God's got to restore them back to the land, and God's going to do exactly that. Jerusalem will be a strong city, and Messiah will reign with salvation. The gates will be open to the righteous nation, meaning Israel. Israel will be the righteous nation that keeps the truth, and they'll enter in. And that day Israel will trust in the Lord, and they will recognize the everlasting strength of God that has sustained them as a people. Uh, those who have oppressed the poor will be brought low because God cares for the poor and the needy. You know, so, you know, the, you think about it, you know, when they finally get at the end of the journey and they look back and they go, oh my goodness, God has been faithful to us all along. You know, and it's oftentimes when we look back over our lives that we see the faithfulness of God. And I would encourage you to do that, especially if you're in a hard place. To look back and see where God has shown himself faithful to you over your life. Because the same God who's been faithful to you throughout your life will be faithful to you today. And will be faithful to you tomorrow. And so on that day, Israel's going to recognize it. They're going to look back over all the promises that God has fulfilled. And they'll recognize that the Lord uh, has sustained us with his everlasting strength. Now... The second point is that all deliverance has come from God. That's the second point of this song, that the humble will be exalted and all deliverance has come from God. In verse 12, it says, Lord, you will establish peace for us, for you also have done all our works in us. O Lord our God, masters beside you have had dominion over us, but by you only we make mention of your name. They are dead. They will not live. They are deceived. They will not rise. Therefore, you have punished and destroyed them and made all their memory to perish. You have increased the nation, O Lord. You have increased the nation. You are glorified. And you have expanded all the borders of the land. And so in God's kingdom, believers will enjoy the peace God gives and will recognize all that God has done for them, that God will judge the nation to try to conquer Israel, God will increase the nation of Israel and expand the borders of the land, and I believe that God will expand the borders, not to the land that we see today, but to the borders that he promised them. And so I have a couple of slides. Um, the first slide shows the, uh, the borders of the land that God promised to Abraham. Now when you see this, it's going to blow your mind. He's going to blow your mind. Look at that. That was the land God promised in the Abrahamic covenant. In the green? Look, what in the green? green. Wow. In all the green. That was what God promised them, right? Quite an wow. interesting. Now look at what they have today. That much. Wow. Go back to the back. On the other one, see there was this oh, Israel, yeah. Jerusalem. At the top of that blue, skinny thing. At the end, at the Mediterranean Sea, at the edge of the Mediterranean Sea. Oh, stop it. You need a poker. Yeah. That's yeah, nothing. Do I need to stand up? Okay, yeah. here we go. Oh, no, 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 Right here. So <laughs> this is all they have. This is all they were promised. This is all they got. Wow. wow. Now, why did they only get this much? What does what does Paul tell us? Unbelief. Unbelief. It's unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> it's unbelievable. That's why. That's why they didn't get the whole enchilada because they didn't yeah. believe. Oh now I want you to get that picture in your mind and think about the promises that God has for you. Oh. We're just like Israel. Okay. You know, God has provided for us this huge mansion, and we're content to sit in the kitchen. Mm. You know? And, like, people go, well, you know, there's a shower in the house. Oh, there's a shower? Really? <laughs> there's other rooms in this room? Oh, yeah. You know? <laughs> I mean, you should go explore the house. There's a place to sleep. You don't have to sleep out. I mean, I can have a bed. Oh, yeah, you should go check out the rest of the house. It's all yours. You know? And, and so Israel... You can see how small the percentage is that God had promised Israel versus what they 
uh, what they got because of unbelief. Now, in verses 16 through 19, Isaiah prophesied that this will be a great time of a, a difficult time of great distress, and he compares it to giving birth when he talks about the uh, the, the day of the Lord. Now, as a guy, I don't really relate to this uh, part of the scriptures, but the ladies can verify this. Okay. Uh, that you know, giving birth. I've heard is very painful. Uh, I know that I got put through a lot <laughs> while my wife was giving birth, but I'm sure it was nothing compared to what she was going through uh, when she when she was giving birth. I can remember we're in the room and you know we went to the class and it was like you know we're going to do this natural because this is about the time when doing things natural was starting to come in and and it's like this we're going to do natural no painkillers we're we're just we're, you know, we don't want anything to get into that baby. And uh, so we did it all natural. And so we're sitting there, and, and she's just being very quiet, and, and just like, oh, do you think I can get a shot? Like, no, we're doing natural. And uh, I'm going to be strong for you. And so uh, after, <laughs> after about an hour of this natural childbirth um, experience, I looked at her and I said, uh, you know, can you kind of hurry it up? Wow. <laughs> You've got some things to do today, you know, and, and, and can you just kind of get it going? And I had no idea. I said, just, she said, what are you talking about? Just, we'll just start pushing. Why don't you first just like push that thing up? I mean, that's how it is on, on television. You know, you, you go into labor at the beginning of the show, and by the end of the show, like an hour later, you got a baby. Oh, yeah. You know, so yeah. I'm thinking, this, this whole thing, I had no idea. Yeah. And, and then I realized that that's not how it works. I realized that very quickly. Uh, that Roxy didn't have any control over this. This is something that was happening to her. And so we were there for like hours and hours and hours, and I didn't want to go anywhere because I didn't want to miss anything, you know? And so I, I realized that, uh, that I, was, I, was, I was trying to get a headache because I hadn't eaten and all this stuff, and so I said, would you mind? Her girlfriend came uh, over to visit, and, uh, and so uh, I thought, well, now she's got her girlfriend's here, I can maybe go get a gra grab a, a quick hamburger, you know, go to the, you know, just get something, come back really quick, and um, and if something happens, you know, they'll text me and I'll turn right around. And so all this is kind of going on. So I took off, and then I come back, and all and this and she was just all of a sudden just, just all this peace. <laughs> <laughs> and she was just sitting there, we missed it, she's so peaceful, and I looked at her and said, you got a shot, didn't you? <laughs> oh, yeah. It was a hair cervical. Yeah, she was. The lady said that, that it was a tiny little shot in the area, not like um, the other girl. It's not, it's, it, don't get defensive. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I would have taken the epidural. But, but anyhow, I don't know why I brought this up. But, you know, it was just the pain of childbirth. You know, it was painful. And uh, she was looking for relief. But imagine going through the pain of childbirth and going through all this birth and then there's no baby. I mean, how bad would that be? You know, to go through all this childbirth and go through all the pain of giving birth and there's nothing to show for it. There's no baby. And that's what the day of the Lord will be for the Israelites. That's what Isaiah is saying. The day of the Lord is going to be like that. It's going to be a, a time of great pain, like, a, a, like a, a, a woman going through childbirth, but there's going to be no deliverance, no baby. There's no deliverance. They're going to give birth to win. But the hope is, at the end of this time of judgment, that God will raise the believers who died during this time. So there will be a resurrection. And so in verse 19 we read, Your dead shall live, together with my dead body they shall arise. Awake and sing, you who dwell in dust. For your dew is like the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Now in verses 21 and 20, uh, Isaiah prophesied of the redeemed to hide. Now, Isaiah kind of jumps back and forth to these different scenarios. And he does it so quickly um, that if you're reading over it, you can almost miss it, you know. And so here he's kind of talked about one scenario. Now all of a sudden he's talking about uh, the redeemed who are going to hide. And in verse 20 he reads, Come, my people, 
Enter your chambers and shut your doors behind you. Hide yourself, as it were, for a little moment until the indignation is past. For behold, the Lord comes out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth will also disclose her blood and will no more cover her slain. In that day the Lord, with his severe sword, great and strong, will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent, Leviathan, that twisted serpent, and he will slay the reptile that is in the sea. Now, he talks here about the, his people, uh, enter your chamber, shut your doors, hide yourself. And this can refer to two groups of people. The first group of people it can refer to is he could be talking about the church that is raptured from the earth. Uh, and so when they're raptured from the earth, they're going to enter into the Lord's chambers in heaven, and they're going to escape this time of indignation on the earth, this time of judgment. The second group it can refer to are the Jewish remnant who come to Christ during the Great Tribulation and hide until judgment is passed. And many scholars believe that they're going to hide in a place called Petra, uh, which is uh, you know, kind of a, a city that's carved into the mountain and there's lots of places for them to hide in there. Um, but there are no direct references to Petra in the Bible. So if you go and you try to look it up, you're going to have a hard time finding the name Petra, um, in, you know, located, or even there is a name of the region. I forget what it is off the top of my head. Um, but there are scriptures that, that, that kind of describe the area surrounding Petra. And so that's why uh, scholars believe that they're going to be hiding down in Petra in Jordan. It talks about going to the... You know, to the land of the Edomites, which is you know in that Jordan area, and so um, there's about three verses, three scriptures that speak of that, that kind of de describe that area, but nothing directly. But we do know what's going to happen. Two things are going to happen. First of all, the inhabitants of the earth will be punished for their iniquity. So the world is going to be judged for sin at this time. And then secondly, Leviathan, which is a reference to Satan, will be punished. And we read about that in Revelation where he says, I saw you know, Satan thrown into the pit. And so Satan will be judged and the Antichrist and the false prophet. Now, the third song in this uh, trilogy of hits from the millennium is uh, in Isaiah 27. It begins with verse 2. And it's a song about the restoration of of Israel. It says, In that day sing to her a vineyard of red wine. I, the Lord, keep it. I water it every moment, <clears throat> lest any hurt it. Keep, I keep it night and day. Now, the vineyard is a symbol of Israel. And after Israel's enemies have been dealt with, and after Israel has been spiritually resurrected, gathered to her land, uh, and multiplies, and the Lord sings over Israel, and he promises to do the following things for her. In verse 3, it says that he will water them, which is a metaphor for God's blessing. He's going to pour out his blessing on Israel. In verse 4, we read that he will protect them, and then in verse 6, that he will bless the whole world through them, that he will once again bless all of the world through Israel. And so, uh, that's why it's important for us to keep in mind that the scriptures, the prophetic scriptures in the Old Testament primarily deal with the nation of Israel. And so, there are, there are some segments of the church and some cults that believe that Israel has been replaced by the church. Israel has never been replaced by the church. Israel is God's chosen people. Israel is God's elect and will continue to be until, uh, until we come to the end of the age, which is what it, Isaiah is talking about here. The Jehovah's Witnesses also believe that they are the, you know, that they have replaced Israel, that they are the replacement for Israel. But God has never replaced Israel with the church. Um, what we see in the church is something different. We're grafted in. You know, we're adopted, the Bible says. We're, we're kind of brought into the family. And we have a different name that's attributed to us. We're called saints. You know, that's one of the words that's attributed to the church. We're called the body of Christ. 
That's another unique term to Gentile believers. We're called uh, the bride of Christ. That is a unique term that's given to, uh, to the believers. And so we have other terms. We're the redeemed. We're the sanctified. Israel is also the redeemed and the sanctified. Anyone who has received the, the Jesus Christ as their Messiah, Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, they are redeemed. They've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And so, um, and so there are some unique terms for Israel. There are some unique terms for uh, us as Gentile believers who have uh, been grafted and adopted into the family of God. Now, in uh, beginning with verse 7, this next section of Scripture talks about God's plan for Israel. And so we read in verse 7, Has he struck Israel as he struck those who struck him? Or has he been slain according to the slaughter of those who were slain by him? In measure, by sending it away, you contended with it. He removed it by his rough wind in the day of the east wind. Therefore, by this, the iniquity of Jacob will be covered. And this is all the fruit of taking away his sin. When he makes all the stones of the altar, like chalk stones that are beaten to dust, wooden images and incense altars shall not stand. And so in these, uh, from 7 to 13, Isaiah explains his plans for Israel during the Great Tribulation. Why is the Great Tribulation coming upon Israel? Well, in verses 7 through 8, first of all, Israel will be judged. Uh, during this time for their sinfulness, for rejecting God. They will be punished in that sense. Um, but Israel's judgment is, is measured and limited. It's not unlimited. God's not just going to go crazy judging his people. It's measured. You know, it's kind of like when you discipline a child. You don't like unleash your fury on your child, right? You, you, it's measured. Because you're, the purpose is not to destroy your child. Now, your enemies, you know, you unleash all your fury on your enemies. You know, you don't, you don't hold anything back because your plan is to destroy them, to wipe them out. And so when God judges the world and, and the enemies of God, he is going to unleash everything. And they will be destroyed. But Israel, it's measured. Because his plan is not to destroy, but to discipline Israel. Now why? In verse 9 we read that God's purpose is to purify Israel from idolatry. That's his whole reason. He's trying to purify his people from idolatry. In verse 13, uh, he wants to make Israel a witness to lead the nations to Christ. And there will be a day when the Assyrians, we're told, and in, in, uh, it mentions the Assyrians, uh, let me look here. So it will be day, the great tongue will be blown. They will come who are about to perish in the land of Assyria. They are outcast from the land of Egypt, shall worship the Lord in the holy mount of Israel. That's what it says here. And so the Assyrians, uh, you know, the outcast of Egypt, they'll come to Jerusalem and they'll worship the Lord. Now I find it interesting is that in verse 13, when it mentions those who are about to perish in the land of Assyria, uh, it's interesting to me that we have a group of people that are about to perish in the land of Assyria, uh, in Assyria right now, who are, who are Assyrians. And those are the Christians that ISIS is trying to kill. You know? And so right here we see them in Scripture. You know? Right here we see what's happening before our eyes in the Middle East in Scripture, but we know it's not going to happen. Why? Because they're going to come and worship the Lord in Jerusalem. You know, so they're going to be amongst those that are going to come and worship the Lord. The outcasts in the land of Egypt, they'll all come to Jerusalem and worship the Lord. Now, chapters 28 through 33 begin the section entitled, The Woes. The Woes. And there are six woes. The first is to Ephraim and Jerusalem, and it's all uh, there. And in the scripture here, we see them mention uh, um, Ephraim and Jerusalem, but it's referring to the people of Samaria and Judah. Uh, Ephraim is the land of Samaria. Uh, Jerusalem is is 
the, in, in the uh, uh, tribe of Judah. You know, so that's the southern part of the kingdom of Israel. And we read in verse 1, Woe to the crown of pride, to the drunkards of Ephraim, whose glorious beauty is a fading flower, which is at the head of the Verdant Valley, to those who are overcome with wine. Behold, the Lord has a mighty and strong one, like a tempest of hail and a destroying storm, like the flood of mighty waters overflowing. Who will bring them down to the earth with his hand? The crown of pride, the drunkards of Ephraim, will be trampled underfoot. And the glorious beauty is a fading flower, which is at the head of the Verdant Valley, like the first fruit before the summer, which an observer sees. He eats it up while it is still in his hand. And so the people of Samaria are proud of their beautiful and their fortified city, their capital. And so drunken on wine and the luxuries of worldly pleasures, they will soon be trampled underfoot. And like a hungry man eats the first ripe fruit, this area was known for its figs, you know. And so like a hungry man would go by fig tree and just start devouring all the figs, the Assyrians will, uh, will eat up the Samaritans. And this prophecy was fulfilled in 722 B.C. when the Assyrian king Sargon II conquered Samaria. And so this was, a, this in fact, happened. Now we bounce forward to a, a future date, to the day of the Lord. In verse 5 it says, In that day the Lord of hosts will be for a crown of glory and a diadem of beauty. To the remnant of his people, for a spirit of, of justice to him who sits in judgment, and for strength to those who turn back the battle at the gate. And so when the Lord returns, he will deliver and redeem a remnant of Israel, and they will look to the Lord for their glory, for their beauty, for wisdom, to judge, and for their military strength. You know, they'll finally look to the Lord for those things. You know, that we would learn the lesson of Israel in that sense, you know. Uh, instead of waiting for crisis before we look to the Lord for wisdom, or look to the Lord for strength or beauty, or all those things that we're looking to the world for, that we would just look to the Lord for those things now. Because He wants to give us those things. He wants to bless us with those things. But so often we wait, like Israel, till we get, you know, till the enemy's at the gate and we're in the point of crisis and, Lord, now I need your strength. Now I need your wisdom. You know? And unfortunately, in, in, oftentimes in those times, uh, we have to go through the consequences of our choices. You know, we're going to see that a little bit later on in Scripture here that God says that He's going to speak to Israel in that way. Then Isaiah speaks to the present state of Judah's spiritual leaders in verses 7 and 8. It says, but they also have erred through wine. So Judah's spiritual leaders are just like the world. They've also erred through wine and through intoxicating drink are out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through intoxicating drink. They are swallowed up by wine. They are out of the way through intoxicating drink. They err in vision, they stumble in judgment, for all tables are full of vomit and filth, and no place is clean. I just am grieved in, our, in the church today that the praise and worship company uh, community is intoxicated with wine. You know, that I can, I can point to some of the top worship leaders in the, in the world today, people that you would know and you buy the records and sing their songs and they're intoxicated with wine. You know, they're just given over to a, a lifestyle of that. You know, the idea of being drunk with wine is, is not, in this reference, talking about being a lush. It's talking about being intoxicated with worldly pleasures. And when the lifestyle of the spiritual leaders become wrapped up in worldly things, they lose their prophetic edge. They lose the ability to speak prophetically to a generation. 
Their prophecies become perverted. They stop seeing clearly. They lose their ability to discern. They call evil good and good evil. And Jesus said that we uh, said we are to be in the world, but not to be of the world. That we are to be different from the world. But the spiritual leaders had become so much like the world, you couldn't tell the difference. There was no difference between the spiritual leaders and, uh, and the worldly leaders. And because the prophets couldn't be trusted, God decided to change his methods of communication. In verse 11 through 13, uh, he writes this, For with stammering lips and and another tongue, he will speak to this people. To whom he said, This is the rest with which you may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. But the word of the Lord was to them precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, here there a little, that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and caught. Now God spoke plainly in his word, precept upon precept, line upon line. But if Judah wouldn't listen to the plain speaking of God's word, that he would speak through stammering lips and another tongue. And who were the stammering lips? Where was this stammering, this language, the stammering lips and the other tongue? He's talking about the Assyrians, the Babylonians. If you're not going to listen to the plain speaking of God's word, then you're going to listen to me speak to you through the Babylonians. And they would experience God's word through the consequence of their actions, the consequences of war. And so it is for many believers. God tells us plainly in His Word how we are to live our lives. But if we won't listen to the plain speaking of God's Word, then perhaps we will listen to the consequence of unrest that comes as we experience the result of ignoring God's Word in our lives. God is going to speak to us in every situation. God is going to speak to us through every circumstance. And he's made it about as plain as it possibly can be. But if we don't listen, then he will speak to us in the midst of our circumstances that we put ourselves into. I see that happening in the church today. I see uh, the crisis that the church finds itself under uh, today as God speaking to us in the midst of our crisis, as we're calling out to him. And I, I, I was seeing recently about all, uh, all these towns that are all up in arms because there's this, this Satanist guy that is really looking for a bunch of attention. And so he, he decided he was going to do a, a satanic mass on a college campus. And all the churches got in arms and they protested. And, and the news people went there and they and they videotape these people speaking and you know they're like why are you here you know like you know and and when you listen to them you go these people sound like crazy people and they did they sounded like crazy people the way they're talking and uh and 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 it was almost like you know if everybody would have just gone to their houses and ignored it then this guy who was a child molester would have come and gone, and no one would have cared. Sure, it's worse than that. And the same thing happened when when the, the last temptation of Christ came in. The church went crazy over that film, and it drove up ticket sales, and it made a ton of money because the church protested it. And everybody that listened to it said, "What is going on here? We should go check out this film because if my Chris, if the Christian guys hate it so much, it must be good." And it got bad ratings because it was a terrible movie. And if nobody would have said anything, then they would have all just, it just would have blown over and no one would have cared. And if the church would simply be the church and quit trying to be these causes and quit trying to protest this and protest that and just be the church, quit trying to be relevant, quit trying to fit in, quit trying to do this, quit trying to to you know, bring down the 
There's darkness. <laughs> it's such a crazy thing if you think about it. Uh, this is how easy it is to bring down the darkness, right? You turn on the light. You don't have to cast out darkness. You just have to turn on the light. You just have to be the light, you know? And, and uh, I mean, just try it. Go in your house sometime and just walk in a dark room and just start rebuking the spirit of darkness in your room. <laughs> you know, just command darkness to leave the room in the name of Jesus. God, cast down all vain imaginations in this room right now. Throw them down in the name of Jesus. Leave the blood of Jesus all over every wall in this place. Nothing's going to happen. Nothing happens until you turn on the light. When the light comes on, hmm. the darkness flees. Because darkness cannot be in the presence of light. Hey. Mm -hmm. See? Ooh. I proved my point. <laughs> <laughs> now here's the thing. Here's the thing. The light of the world lives in every one of you. Mm -hmm. The light of the world lives in every one of you. You have no idea how bright you are. <laughs> you have no idea how bright you are. And the reason why the world is attacking us is because the world does not like the light that's inside of us. They hate it. it you know, my, my wife, when it gets too bright, she's like, it's too bright. She needs her sunglasses, you know? And it's the same thing. I'm not comparing it to the, to the, to the world or anything like that. <laughs> but it's just, you know. But that's how the that's how the that's how the world is, right? And the light the light's too bright. It's like, oh, turn that light off. You know, get out of my presence. And Israel, you know, if they just would have been the light of God is all the movie. You know, but they didn't be one of years ago. Versus uh um, verses 14 through 22, Isaiah prophesies about the end time. Uh, well, at verse 15 it says, uh, Because you have said, We have made a covenant with death, and with Sheol we are in agreement. When the overflowing scourge passes through, it will not come to us, for we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood we have hidden ourselves. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not act hastily. Also I will make justice the measuring line and righteousness the plummet. The hail will sweep away the refuge of lies, and the waters will overflow the hiding place. Your covenant with death will be annulled, and your agreement with Sheol will not stand. When the overflowing scourge passes through, then you will be trampled down by it. Now the events Isaiah sees in this passage is are connected with the seventh seal in Revelation. The Jewish leaders will make a covenant with death, a seven-year agreement with a political leader who will promise peace. In Scripture, this person is known as the beast of Revelation 13.1 or the Assyrian in Micah 5.5. Daniel prophesies this peace treaty will be broken after three and a half years. The Jewish leaders will find out they misplaced their trust. But those who trust in the Lord, who place their trust in the precious cornerstone, Jesus Christ, they will not be overtaken by the words of this politician. They're not going to be fooled by it in the least. In verse 22 it says, Now therefore do not be mockers, lest your bonds be made strong. For I have heard from the Lord God of hosts that destruction determined even upon the whole earth. And so regardless of what this politician says, God says that destruction has already been determined and it will affect the whole earth. And so the believer, the one who has been enlightened by the Spirit of God, is going to hear a, you know, someone say, hey, you know what, peace has finally come. But we know better. We know better. When we hear that, we're not going to think, oh yeah, peace has come. Because peace hasn't come. Uh, because the Bible tells us that there is a determined period of time when judgment is going to come. Verse 23 through 29, God explains his ways with his people. It says, Give ear and hear my voice. Listen and hear my speech. 
Does the plowman keep plowing all day to sow? Does he keep turning his soil and breaking the clods? When he has leveled its surface, does he not sow the black cumin and scatter the cumin? Plant the wheat in rows, the barley in the appointed place, and the spelt in its place. For he instructs him in right judgment, his God teaches him. And so Isaiah turns now to a metaphor of farming. And just like a farmer plows uh, the ground to prepare the soil for the seed, and he sows the seed, he harvests the crops, and uses the proper threshing machine uh, for each type of grain to separate the edible part of the grain from the chaff that covers the grain. There's, you know, depending on what the uh, what it is you're harvesting, you have to have different machines that handle it. Um, it was fascinating when we were uh, visited the farms. Uh, our, our friends they own a Tarisha Farms, and we went and saw the different machines. You know, this machine handles this kind of grain. This machine handles that kind of grain. This machine gets the corn, and, and they would take it, and, and it was, and it just blew my mind, you know, how they could take this machine, this big old tractor-looking machine, and would go through a field, and it could separate just the corn off of it, and take and get rid of everything out as it's plowing through. It's just unbelievable these machines that they've developed, and so you know, there's these different kinds of machines that handle different kinds of grain. And in the same way, the Lord will plow the ground of Israel to prepare the soil of their hearts for the seed of his word. And he will sow the seed into their hearts and harvest the true crop of believers in Israel. And then he'll use the proper threshing machine to expose the seed, that the grain, the, the edible part, you know, that which has eternal value in their heart. And he does it in a way that doesn't damage the grain. That was the other thing that was blowing my mind, to see these huge, massive machines, and they could go through a field and the grain was not damaged. You know, the grain was, was perfect. It was just unbelievable how, how it worked. And so God will, will, will take, you know, will take Israel through this process and the grain won't be damaged. Now in chapter 29, we come to the second book. And this is spoken to Jerusalem and the people of Judah. In verse 1 we read, Woe to Ariel, to Ariel the city where David dwelt. As year to year, let feet come around. Yet I will distress Ariel, there shall be heaviness and sorrow, and it shall be to me as Ariel. I will encamp against you all around, I will lay siege against you with the mound. I will raise siege works against you. You shall be brought down, you shall speak out of the ground, your speech shall be low, out of the dust, your voice shall be like a medium out of the ground, and your speech shall whisper out of the dust. Ariel is Jerusalem, and Jerusalem will be attacked in the last day. But God will also punish those who attack Jerusalem. In verse 6 we read, You will be punished by the Lord of hosts with thunder and earthquake, with a, and a great noise, with storm and a tempest, um, and the flame of devouring fire, the multitude of all the nations who fight against Ariel, even all who fight against her and her fortress and distress her shall be as a dream of a night vision. And so in verses 9 through 13, Isaiah gives us insight as to why Jerusalem is attacked. And he says it's because of the blindness of the people. In verse 13, we read that they are spiritually Blind. Let's, let's look at verse 10 actually first. It says, pause in, or verse 9, it says, pause and wonder. Bind yourselves and be blind. They are drunk, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with intoxicating drink. For the Lord has poured out on you the spirit of deep sleep and has closed your eyes, namely the prophet, and he has covered your heads, namely the seer. So how do they become spiritually blind? By rejecting God. In verse 13 it says, Therefore the Lord said, Inasmuch as these people draw near with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but have removed their hearts far from me, and their fear towards me is taught by the commandment of men. And so they've exchanged the, the, they've exchanged their hearts for legalism. You know, they're, they, they're, uh, they're, they're being ruled by fear, taught by the commandment of men, instead of having their hearts be drawn to the Lord. There's a complete change that's happened there. 
And Isaiah now, in, in uh, verse 15 now, we come to the third woe. In, uh, in verse 15 it says, Woe to those who seek deep to hide their counsel far from the Lord. And their works are in the dark. And they say, Who sees us? And who knows us? Surely you have things turned around. Shall the potter be esteemed as the clay? For shall the thing made say of him who made it, He did not make me? You know, God didn't make me. Or shall the thing formed say of him who formed it, he has no understanding? God doesn't understand me. We hear that today. The third woe is pronounced against the Jewish remnant. But after the third woe comes, restoration happens in six areas. In verse 17, the land will be restored and made productive. In verse 18, the spiritually deaf will hear, the blind will see. In verse 19, the meek and the poor will rejoice in the Lord. In verses 20 and 21, the enemies of the people of Israel will be destroyed. In verses 22 through 23, the forefathers of Israel will no longer be ashamed of their descendants because they will fear and honor the Lord. And then in verse 24, the people of Israel will understand and rejoice when they receive instruction from the Lord. Now the fourth woe. The fourth woe is pronounced against the leaders and the people of Jerusalem. And we see this in chapter 30. It says, Woe to the rebellious children, says the Lord, who take counsel, but not of me, and who devise plans, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin, who walk to go down to Egypt, and have not asked my advice, to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh, and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. Therefore the strength of Pharaoh shall be your shame, and trust in the shadow of Egypt, Egypt shall be your humiliation. You know, Egypt represents the world, the world's wisdom and strength. And the people of Judah, threatened with an attack of Assyria, sent messengers with gifts to seek military alliance with the Egyptians. And so, when the Assyrians were coming against Judah, they said, hey, we need help. Where are we going to get help? Well, let's go down and get Egypt to be on our side. If Egypt's on our side, then we got help. And of course, God took offense to that because they didn't go to him. And so God rebukes Judah for their actions. And he saw them as, verse 1, a rebellious act because they were not to make any alliances with the people of the world. God told them, don't make alliances with the world. And they made alliances with the world. They were also a proud act, because human pride seeks no counsel from God. You know, human pride says, you know what, I'm going to go seek counsel elsewhere than, uh, than from the Lord. In verse 2, they're an unfaithful act, because they sought protection from another man. You know, Israel... Well, you know, was uh, the bride in a sense they were wedded to God, you know. God was their husband, and someone other than Israel's husband uh, took care of them. You know, imagine if your wife, uh, you know, instead of coming to you for protection, went to the neighbor next door. You know, you'd kind of be like, what are you doing? You know? Now, um, more than that. We're just going to let that one in. <laughs> but it was also a foolish act because Israel was sending its wealth to the world and received nothing in return except shame and humiliation. You see, Judah was seeking wisdom and strength in the world, not God. And you can pay the world money and come back empty-handed or you can turn to the Lord, obey His ways, and see victory in your life. And it's amazing to me how believers will turn to the world for help because they think that the world is more expert than God. And they'll spend a lot of money on the world's counselors and find no help. You know, it, it's, uh, it was something that, uh, as I was going through training uh, and learning how to counsel, and I went to a secular university, uh, they told us, one third of the people you talk to will get well. One third won't change. And one third will get worse. So two thirds of the people 
that go to counseling don't get any help. Now imagine if you ran a business where two-thirds of the cars you fixed didn't work. You know, two-thirds of the food you sold was rotten. Two-thirds of whatever you did. What would, would, you, would you ever call that a success? No, you'd shut them down. You'd run them out of business. And yet the Lord says that everyone that turns to me, everyone that comes to me, gets help. Everyone that turns to the Lord gets healed, gets restored. And so, um, and so Israel was not turning to the Lord. They were turning to Egypt. And they were giving their wealth to Egypt. The real problem is that Judah trusted in their self-will, not God's word. Verse 8 we read, Now go write it before them on a tablet, and note it on a scroll, that it may be for time to come, forever and ever, that this is a rebellious people, lying children, children who will not hear the law of the Lord, who say to the seers, do not see, and to the prophets, do not prophesy to us right things. Speak to us smooth things, and prophesy deceit. You know, the thing is, is that uh, one of the things that I hear recently is that people believe that the preaching of grace is preaching smooth things, prophesying deceit. Um, and they say that because they're really ignorant of what grace is. They really don't understand what grace is. And when you, real, when you understand what grace is, you realize that grace is the only power that destroys the work of darkness in a person's life. Because grace is the powerful presence of Jesus working in a person's life. It's Jesus at work. And grace has more power than legalism, more conviction than condemnation, and it results in a greater desire to obey than obligation. Grace saves. Only grace saves. You know, for by grace you are saved through faith. And so it's not a smooth thing. It's actually a very powerful thing. And when people allow God's grace to change their life, when they allow God to have His way in their life, and they allow God to destroy the unfruitful works of darkness in their life, they are transformed, changed people. Never the same. Amen. You know, never the same. The only way to find real help is to rest in God's grace. In verse 15 it says, For thus says the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, In returning and rest you shall be saved. In quietness and confidence shall be your strength. But you would not. And you said, No, for we will flee on horses. Therefore, you shall flee, and we will ride on swift horses. Therefore, those who, perceive, who pursue you shall be swift. You know, God is saying, Hey, come here and rest. And they're saying, Nah, because look, the bad guys are coming. They're right there. We're going to get on our horses and we're going to get out of here. And God's, gonna, and God's telling them, look, you can go on your horses, and you can have fast horses, but their horses are fast too. You can run, but they run too. Or you can rest here, and I'll destroy them. I'll destroy them all. If you won't rest in God's grace, then you will be disappointed because nothing else you rest in works. Nothing else you rest in will work. Now in verses 18 through 26, it speaks of the future blessing coming to Judah. In verse 19, it, he says that he will give them a settled home, that he will cause them to weep no more, that he will answer their prayers. In verses 20 and 21, it said, he says that he will teach them personally and clearly. I'm not going to talk to you anymore through parables and prophets. I'm going to talk to you myself. In verse 22, it says, he will cause them to destroy their idols. And 23 through 25, he will bless them abundantly in the land. And 26, the Lord himself will heal them. And then in verses 27 through 33, we, it speaks of the final judgment coming to Israel's enemies. 
And the verse I love uh, is verse 31 because it speaks of the power of worship. In verse 31 it says, For through the voice of the Lord, Assyria will be beaten down. As he strikes with the rod, and in every place where the staff of punishment passes, which the Lord lays on him, it will be with tambourine and harp, and in battles of brandishing he will fight with it. So every time the rod comes down on the back of the enemy, it's to the, it's to the sound of worship. Tambourines and harp, music that's being played in, in thanksgiving to God. You know, and that's really what spiritual warfare is. We worship the Lord, He destroys the enemy. We we give our praise to God, God goes to defeat the enemy, He does battle for us. You know, we don't do the fighting. Nowhere in the Bible do you see Israel, you know, it, it's like God says, Look, I'm gonna do the fighting for you. He told them, I'm gonna go drive, you know, the, the, the map that we saw with all of that land. He told Israel, I'm going to go before you and I'm going to drive out all your enemies. Just go and take the land. I'm going to drive them out. Just go and get it. What did they think? Oh, we've got to get our horses ready. we got to get fast horses. we got a battle to prepare for them. we got to, you know, we got to get our armor on. we got to get prepared. We can't be, you know, we can't go out with, that, with our armor and have chains and all this stuff because we're going to get wiped out. That's how they went into it. We're going to be wiped out by the enemy. A lot of Christians feel that way. They don't realize how powerful their God is. You know, that God has already defeated. He's already gone before us and chased out our enemy. We just got to go get the land. The land that he's given us. And, uh, and, and we just worship him. And if we worship him, he defeats the enemy in our life. We'll continue next week with uh, chapter 31, and we'll go 31 through 35. And uh, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word, and thank you for uh, just, uh, Lord, I'm just so encouraged through this study in Isaiah. Because, Lord, it gives us such a picture of one of your faithfulness, Lord, seeing how you are going to just wrap everything up at the end of the age. And Lord, you're going to judge the evil one. You're going to judge all wickedness, Lord, iniquity. Everything is going to be judged. Lord, and, and your righteousness is going to be established in the, in the world. Lord. And you will be worshipped and adored and honored as the King of kings and the Lord, of, as the creator of the universe, the one who has created and made all things. You will finally get your rightful place. And, and Lord, we are just looking forward to seeing you uh, this, this right all along. But Lord, we know even today as, as we're walking through this life, Lord, that you're righting the wrongs in our lives right now. Lord, the things that have been done to us, the things that we have done, you give us your word, which gives us the path for peace, that gives us the path for for healing and understanding, Lord, you give us everything that we need to be complete and whole and healthy. Lord, you give us everything we need to walk in strength, to walk in your power and your might. Lord, and open our eyes, set us free from anything that holds us back in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, um, lots of you.